I look around this room and um, I see people like Deborah March from the Lead Institute for Real Estate Studies who's been reaching out to the community. I see uh, Rama Venkat who's working on energy efficiency and been doing that for years. I mean, I just look around, there's too many names to be mentioned here. I see some of our PhD Urban Sustainability Initiative GAs who are doing their work in their departments. It has truly been a team effort and it's been going on for some time. Now it's a time to bring it together, to organize it, to brand it, to brand UNLV, and to move out there and show what we can offer and work with all different kinds of groups in sincere partnerships. We don't have all the answers, but we have some of the answers. And at any rate, I would tell you that this effort most recently started about three years ago when I came into this present position of vice president and I said to myself, I'm gonna try and put together as best I can what I think we should be doing. At that point, we had a new president and uh, as most of you know, I've been around here quite a few years. And so I brought together volunteers from our faculty and staff, all who I realized an interest in urban sustainability. It could be environmental, it could be social, cultural, it could be economic. They're all interdependent, they're all intertwined, but I brought them together and there were about 50 of those faculty and staff members. And in fact, uh, some of them are here today and if they're here today, would you just raise your hand? Here's Deborah, there's Tom Piotta, Orly, they just quite a few are here. A lot of them are teaching classes as a matter of fact and that's why they're not here. And then that grew into a list serve of faculty and staff and some community members of over 300 where we have a website and we send out information about sustainability advances and events on our campus and in the city and county. And that then developed into what we're seeing now, both the Lindsay Gift as well as the Brookings Institution. Uh, we have an opportunity now to become actively involved in meaningful and transformative research to affect our local as well as national and international areas, to develop policies, to come up with some new technology that will truly transform this area. A lot of people are concerned, self-included, because I do want to retire someday, about the economic recession. And uh, we just got back from Arizona, and it was the talk of all our neighbors and friends in Arizona. We have the same problems. Uh, all they want to talk about is the unemployment. They want to talk about as well issues of health care, the health insurance debate. It's the same everywhere. And of course, a major issue in Arizona is immigration. And so uh, they, what we're going to be studying here with Lindsay and the Brookings Institution goes way beyond Nevada's borders, goes way beyond. In fact, I would say it goes all the way to places like Dubai, if you think about the same arid environment in which the city is located. There's a lot of concern, temporary concern, I think, about growth, that Las Vegas is not growing like it once was growing. Well, of course, that's related to the economy, but I think the Brookings Institution Folks, especially uh, Mark and, and uh, Robert, will tell us that this is probably a bump in the road. There are some major pull attractive aspects about Las Vegas in this region and the Intermountain West where all the major cities are gonna continue to grow. Denver, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Albuquerque North, Salt Lake City, not just us. But enough of introduction, I'll just simply say that for me, uh, this is the culmination of a lot of years of work, and it was a bottoms up effort. And then with the new administration coming on, and especially our president, Neil Smastrick, it became a top down effort, and the two efforts met in the middle. And it was an effort by some terrific community members. Uh, you all heard from Brian Greenspun this morning, but I would tell you, I look around the room here and uh, Tom Riley and people who you may or may not know, Mike Saltman, who's doing Midtown UNLV, 
Um, just all kinds of people. The, we're, we've partnered with Urban Land Institute, American Institute of Architects, Urban Planning Association, we, all different kinds of partners. We've partnered with Arizona State University, Desert Research Institute, UNR. We have been reaching out and hopefully, I, I hope that the city and the state and the region realizes that and appreciates that. I can't tell you how many times I go out to social events in Las Vegas and throughout Nevada, and they, they often ask, and what does you, you know, we do? No, I'm really serious, and that's a serious problem in terms of we need to expose our role in terms of transforming and making this a viable, sustainable area. So enough of that, and this time I'm going to um, introduce to you uh, 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 quickly becoming a good friend, and uh, he's our first speaker, our first inaugural Brookings speaker for Brookings Mountain West, Dr. Bill Antholis, and the, his title, as told to you earlier, is Managing Director of the Brookings Institution, and he'll be the Director of Brookings Mountain West, but uh, he has an impressive record, and um, I'm not going to read all of it because he'll just incredibly get the big head and, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we all know he's very good, but as managing director of Brookings, he, he helps the president Strobe Talbot and the other vice presidents manage the full range of policy studies, initiatives, and outreach efforts that Brookings is so well known for. In fact, he's got to leave tomorrow morning to go back and run a retreat. And I said, wouldn't you just rather stay here? And he said, yeah. <laughs> he could play some more golf here. He also continues to uh, conduct research in the area of climate change. Uh, prior to joining Brookings, he was Director of Studies and Senior Fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He was Director for G8 Affairs, the National Security Council and National Economic Council. He was Deputy Director of the White House Climate Change Policy Team in the Clinton Administration. He worked in the State Department's Policy Planning and Staff Bureau of Economic Affairs, served as an International Affairs Fellow on the Council of Foreign Relations and Visiting Fellow at Princeton University. He receives his PhD from Yale University and his BA from University of Virginia. Without any further delay, let me introduce you to Bill Antholis. It's terrific to be here. Um, my thanks to Ron, and uh, when I said earlier today that Brookings likes to go from the local to the national to the global and back again, Ron and Susan as a family do this every night. And uh, when I was here two weeks ago, uh, first for the Lindsay launch, which was so keenly focused on uh, the Nevada region, uh, the southern Nevada region in Las Vegas, um, and then that was the first event that I went to, and then the last event before I climbed on it, Red Eye Home was Susan's welcoming reception for all the international students and, and faculty here. And it gave me a sense of, of what the university's uh, uh, breadth can be and is. And in a sense, it reminded me why we're here. We, Brookings, like to go from the local to the national to the global. And this index that I'm going to talk about today is uh, another effort that we're doing here to try to bring together um, our uh, sprawling research uh, agenda at Brookings. Um, so, make sure that this is working. The, the way that this comes together for us is we have five research programs at Brookings. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, foreign policy, uh, glo uh, governance studies, economic studies, foreign policy, metro, and global economy and develop, uh, development. And we started thinking about how can we together work to assess what's going on. This was particularly in the wake of the financial crisis last fall uh, and the presidential election. And we started talking about pulling together a, con uh, a composite set of matrices that looked at a number of trends. And we went back and we read through a bunch of documents and we focused on the opening paragraph of the Constitution. Um, you know, and in addition to forming a more perfect union and justice and domestic tranquility, we focused on the three core, what we thought the three core missions of the federal government were at the time of the founding. Providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare, and securing the blessings of liberty. 
And we tried to think across the institution, how do we marry up against that, in, uh, against those three core um, objectives of government in how we assess and understand where the country and the world is at any one time? How do we connect the, the local, the national, and the global? And how do we bring the economic and political dimensions of those, um, of those spheres of focus um, together in a, in a way? And so our first How We Were Doing Index tried to do that. And what we tried to do in this first index was benchmark the first six months of the Obama presidency against uh, the five predecessors and how they were doing at six months into their presidency uh, in each of these three spheres. So the first one was looking at the common defense. And actually what I'm gonna do is have um, some friends and colleagues here pass out the version that appeared in the Washington Post. I think it was also run in the, in the Las Vegas Sun, although I didn't have a hard copy version to produce. Next time we'll do that. And, and this is both a benchmark for how they're doing, how the Obama administration and how we, the country, and the world are doing six months in against these five presidencies. Moving forward on a quarterly basis, what we at Brookings are gonna do, are gonna compare each quarter against the three quarters that preceded it. And then once a year, we will compare at a yearly mark how it compares back against the four previous years. So you'll have a little bit of a shifting time perspective, sort of in the introduction today when Neil was talking about how long this was going on for two years, and I talked about how it was really five years, and then Brian Trump to solve with 20 years. Um, this one actually goes back 32 years to Jimmy Carter. What, what you see in the top, and what this shading tries to represent is um, in general terms, and it's a little bit hard because depending on perspective uh, to, to indicate positive versus negative, and I'll talk about one or two that sort of belie the color coding, but generally lighter is better than darker. But on the first two items, we decided not to give them any um, qualitative value. That is the size of defense budgets and uh, the number of military person stationed abroad. And the, the reason for that is that there is a very strong argument that American, un, that the unipolar world that we've come out of the Cold War and into has actually been a, um, a beneficial thing, not just for the United States, but for the planet. And you can see that in a few of the metrices here. So for instance, uh, the number of uh, US military combat fatalities have generally been relatively low as defense budgets have, have um, gone back to their pre-Cold War levels. The one thing that Obama has inherited is two wars, which he now owns. And so what you see is in the first six months of his presidency, he's had more combat fatalities than in any of the previous five presidencies, any one of them, but all of them combined. Now, if we had, had included Richard Nixon in here, him inheriting the Vietnam War, those combat fatalities would have been higher. Um, but it gives you a sense that easily the biggest foreign policy challenge that he faces are these two wars that are out there. On the number of nations that have tested a nuclear weapon, this was actually a good news story in the Cold War. Actually, you could have played the numbers slightly differently um, in the middle period because with the consolidation of the Soviet Union, uh, there were two other countries that technically were independent states even though they were under the Soviet umbrella. Uh, Belarus and Ukraine that hacked nuclear weapons. So depending on how you count it, it actually went down in the early years of the Clinton administration. But what we've seen was uh, in, uh, by the time George Bush took office, India and Pakistan had tested, um, and then North Korea also tested. And that's a very troubling uh, data point that's out there, particularly with some major um, negotiations ongoing. The, the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968 is falling apart, uh, partly because you have these new countries. Th that treaty said that um, unless you were a signatory of the treaty and were acknowledged as a nuclear state, you couldn't test a nuclear weapon. And what's happened in the last uh, nine years is that uh, 10 years since India and Pakistan tested in, in 11 years now, uh, in 1998, is that you see a number of countries abrogating that treaty. So one major challenge moving forward for the Obama administration that hasn't gotten as much attention to date because of the wars in Afghanistan and, and, pa and uh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and, and in um, Iraq is that this negotiation is gonna be ongoing over the next few years, starting first with Russia and then other nuclear weapons states. 
Um, again, armed conflicts worldwide, that number has actually come down, and many people think that that is a result of the end of the Cold War. So while we're feeling two armed conflicts in the United States, the rest of the world actually is looking a little bit more peaceful. And to some degree, that's because uh, it, during the Cold War, superpower rivalry wasn't happening between the two superpowers. It was happening in Central America. It was happening in Southern Africa. Uh, that has appeared to um, back off a bit. And as a result, you see civilian casualties uh, worldwide are also down. So again, we're experiencing it quite powerfully because we're engaged in these two conflicts. The rest of the world is actually feeling a bit more peaceful. Um, Another terrific development that's happened in the world has been world population. While world population has been growing, it turned, which may not be such a good thing, as you can see, we shade that darker blue, the share of people living in poverty in the world has de declined dramatically. And that's largely because of economic growth in India and China. Um, you know, literally a billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the last decade alone in those two places. It's also happening in Latin America and Africa. Um, and I think one thing that we think is going to be happening over the next set of years, we're going to try set of years, and we're going to be trying in future indices to look at is growth in those two places, and um, and w because we're actually somewhat bullish on both of those places. And then lastly, uh, with a major climate change negotiation happening in Copenhagen in December of this year, we wanted to track at least in this first one where the concentration of, of greenhouse gas emissions in the climate are. We've used carbon concentrations as the metric here. Most scientists believe that 470 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere is dangerous. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause over the next 50 years um, real consequential global warming, including potentially the melting of the ice caps, and then it throws off all kinds of weather patterns. We're getting very close to that. We're at 439 now. 470 is considered dangerous. So unless we start bending that curve down, we could be in real trouble. The general welfare. This is essentially, for us, a marker of where we are in the economy. And it's not, uh, it's not going to be surprising to anybody in this room that the economy is not doing well. What we think this chart shows is what makes this recession so great. It turns out that many presidents inherit recessions. Part of the reason, reason um, presidents change, and part, particularly presidents from different parties take over, is because they're inheriting a bad situation and they're going to make it better. That was the case under uh, Jimmy Carter inheriting the, uh, the Gerald Ford recession from the first oil shock. Ronald Reagan, in part, inheriting uh, the second oil shock recession that Jimmy Carter lived through. Um, George Bush actually had inherited a relatively good economy, but by the time Bill Clinton uh, ran against him, the economy in the wake of the first Gulf War was not doing so well. Um, George Bush inherited, actually, a decent economy, kind of, but then the dot-com bubble hit. Um, and it, it really wasn't as good. But then, obviously, the Obama uh, administration is inheriting a bad situation. And the reason it's so bad is the number or the, the way that you can feel on why this recession is so great is the number of different um, elements of economic growth that are being affected right now. In previous recessions, you often had one or two. You had perhaps high inflation, perhaps high unemployment. But uh, on the Obama uh, administration, nearly everything is bad, with two exceptions. We have low inflation, and that's a good thing, and we have low interest rates. Um, we also have a relatively lower savings rate. This is one of those uh, things that I was going to mention that um, uh, the personal savings rate is actually back down to 4.3%. Now, generally, we've been hearing uh, that Americans don't save enough. And actually, in this case, that's not a good thing, because by retracting so quickly, it's affected the other metrices that are out there. Um, we've included two other statistics in here. I want to see how I go back. How do I go back? Um, two other statistics that I want to point out that are going to be a, a part of this. These, these bottom two, which affect a place like Las Vegas, the percentage of large metropolitan areas with major housing price drops, 61% in this recession. In the Clinton recession and in the Reagan recession, those numbers were high as well. But what you didn't have in those is the percentage of large, uh, large metros that also experienced employment declines, 97% in the Obama recession, um, compared to only 37% and 20% in the uh, in the Bush and, and Reagan recessions. 
And then finally, the blessings of liberty. We, we debated internally about this title. Uh, what we were trying to give a sense was the political health of the country. Um, and some of our branding people, particularly on the economic side, didn't really know what that meant. But what we think about this is how, how robustly is the administration doing in engaging uh, with a free public, a public that, that wants to be engaged and not just receive uh, the dictates of government. Um, and, and this is the best news story that Obama had at the six-month point. Uh, the numbers have come, come down a little bit since, but I think they're still fairly robust. And what's robust is not the personal popularity, which as you can see from previous administrations, Jimmy Carter was quite popular at six months, Ronald Reagan, um, George Bush, uh, but the turnaround in public mood, not since Reagan in a first six month period, have you seen such a turnaround in how Americans uh, think the country's going. And what that turnaround here is, the metric is, uh, the right track, wrong track number was 14 points worse when he was inaugurated than it was six months later uh, in the middle of July. Um, and that compares very favorably with Reagan. The reason that that was the case, uh, well, one of the reasons that it's very telling is where independent voters are. And this is the number that the White House looks at very carefully. And there are two things about this. Um, one is he has a very relatively high number. It's, it's in George Bush territory from uh, the first six months, uh, very much so where Reagan and even Jimmy Carter were at six months. But what you see in the bottom number is that that also tells something important that's going on in the country, which is political polarization has really um, risen in the country. It's, there's a 65% gap between uh, President Obama's approval rating among Democrats, which is 85%, and among Republicans, which is 20%. There are a couple reasons behind that, and one of them is the shrinking of the Republican Party. Self-identified Republicans have gone from being 35% of the electorate to under 30% of the electorate. They are a much harder core. They are much less inclined uh, to view the president favorably. Some of them have shifted to being independents. A few Republicans have shifted, particularly in the Northeast, have shifted to being Democrats. So I think that the important thing to watch moving forward is not just what that um, gap between Democratic and Republican ratings look like, but also independence, and then the number behind them, which is the self-identification of people. If healthcare goes, um, does not, the healthcare reform effort doesn't go well, if the energy effort also fails, will the Republicans be beneficiaries of that? Will there just be a more disaffected independent pool? Those are the things that we're trying to track. So I, I wanna stop there because I wanna leave time for questions and, and get into the next lecture. But this is just to give you a sense of what we are doing in the How We're Doing Index and what we hope to be doing over the next set of years. And we hope this to be a regular feature of our involvement here in, uh, in Las Vegas and in Southern Nevada. Uh, I hope you're able to stay for our next two speakers. Uh, just a couple of comments so we, so before we introduce them. First off, Bill, thank you again for the interesting snapshot of where the U.S. stands on some important metrics. Uh, with your, I think your new index of global and national trends uh, coming out, it's going to be very helpful to us and to the uh, nation. I uh, can't, couldn't help but uh, start counting. I, I lost it after a while, the number of times that Bill mentioned the word energy. Um, I have to tell you that we are making uh, terrific strides in the area of renewable energies. We've received about $55 million in research funding to do renewable energy research over the last three years, uh, in part responsible to the work of our uh, faculty in science and engineering. Hold on one second. Okay, I think it's all right. Okay. You okay? All right, very good. Uh, back again to renewable energies. About $55 million in research uh, funding for renewable energies and biofuels, solar, hydrogen, and so forth. Uh, one of the people that's responsible for so much of this work is in our audience today, and I'd like to introduce to you Oliver Hemmers. Oliver, stand up. Stand up. Oliver. Thank you. 
is the executive director of the Harry Reid Center for Environmental Studies. And uh, Oliver has taken over that unit and reshaped it and made it into various divisions of which one of the major divisions deals with renewable energy research. Also has one of the strongest uh, radiochemistry programs uh, housed, partly housed, within the Harry Reid Center, where they're dealing with nuclear uh, fuels, dealing with nuclear engineering, reprocessing of nuclear spent fuel, et cetera, and also doing a tremendous amount of environmental work. I would say that the Harry Reid Center, the Lindsay Institute, and the Brookings Institution, that is the Brookings Mountain West, are three of the most eventful things that have occurred at UNLV in the last several years. Uh, but I would tell you on the horizon, we're, it's not over, folks. We have one more coming. And uh, we, we hope we get some uh, positive movement for this fourth effort in the very near future. And we're working very closely with uh, one of our key senators located in Washington, D.C., last name Reed. Um, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but Secretary of Energy Chu put forth eight proposals for eight energy hubs located at universities where they would be centers housed there, but working with other universities in the area, working with some of the national labs, working with local government, businesses, and so forth to bring energy, not just in terms of research, but the transfer of that technology to the marketplace and to create a bigger economy and to create jobs. It is a transformative kind of idea in terms of not just science, but economy. Um, I had the pleasure last week of uh, President Maastricht and I went down to Searchlight, Nevada and um, had the best 45 minutes of my week, I can tell you that. Um, searchlight is, um, well, it's not so much, but, I, but there's a certain house there and a certain center who lives there that really was helpful, and I could tell you he, he promised he was going to do everything he possibly could to get this thing started because you know how committed he is. We've had two energy summits in a row here at UNLV where they've drawn hundreds upon hundreds of people. I think the first one was about 1,200. The second one was a little over 1,000 of national uh, people, uh, T. Boone Pickens, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, the list goes on and on. And at any rate, um, I, I have every confidence that he's going to do his best. He needs, he wants to do it for Nevada, he wants to do it for the Southwest, he wants to do it for the nation. Now, if that sounds like a political plug, I don't mean for it to be, because I can tell you that I think Dina Titus and others as well are working very hard for the same goals. It's simply a fact that we are closely associated with him, we have worked with this senator, and we think his values are right. So at any rate, for, for the growth of our area. Okay, yeah, I'm a Democrat. Okay, so, um, see, when, you, when you're really high up, you're not, well, oh, but I'm really part of it. <laughs> but at any rate, as so you can say that when you're not the president of the university. At any rate, I want to introduce our next speakers. Um, we have the pleasure of having two individuals who were the authors of Mountain Megas, America's newest metropolitan places and a federal partnership to help them prosper. Uh, first, we have Rob Lang, who's joining UNLV as a faculty member in January 2010 as a professor of sociology uh, and Las Vegas research director of the Brookings Mountain West Initiative. He'll also serve as interim executive director of the Lindsay Institute, although we are now in the process of a national search for an executive director. And um, we are looking for the best talent. Currently, he is a professor of urban planning and director of urban affairs and planning program at Virginia Tech's National Capital Region. He's also co-director of the Metropolitan Institute at Virginia Tech and editor of the scholarly journal Housing Policy Debate. In 2008, he was a Fulbright Fellow in Paris. In 2006, he was Distinguished Professor at Arizona State University, Visiting Professor at Arizona State University. He's also recently a Planning and Development Fellow at Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and a Visiting Fellow of the University of California and is presently Fellow of the Urban Land Institute in Washington. 
Mark Miro is Director of Policy for the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program in Washington, D.C., <coughs> and, and also a, our Research Director of Brookings Mountain West, stationed in D.C. At Brookings, Mark, Mark manages the Metro Program's public policy analysis and leads key policy research projects. He's the author of numerous studies, including Metro Policy, Shaping a New Federal Partnership for Metropolitan Nation, Energy Discovery Innovative Institutes, A Step Toward America's Energy Sustainability, and two major reports on the Federal Stimulus Program, the Metro Potential and AARRA, an early assessment of the American Recovery and Reinvestment, and most recently, implementing ARRA, Innovations in Design in Metropolitan America. These reports represent key elements of the Metro's program's Blueprint for American Prosperity Initiative. Well, the list goes on and on. Prior to Brookings, Muro was a senior fellow analyst at the Morrison Institute for Public Policy at Arizona State University. He was also a staff writer for the Boston Globe and an editorial writer for the Arizona Daily Star. He's a member of City States Group, a, ne a network of journalists, speakers, and civic leaders focused on building competitive, equitable, and sustainable 21st century metro areas. He received his baccalaureate at Harvard and a master's in, in American Studies from the University of California, Berkeley. It is my real pleasure to introduce our two new research directors of, of Brookings Mountain West. Okay, I'm going to continue the theme of uh, perhaps excessive uh, mutual admiration by thanking Ron. Uh, and at the risk of overdoing the mutual admiration side, I want to call out a few Las Vegans uh, who have been here this morning, who've been incredibly welcoming of the work we in Brookings as a whole propose doing. Uh, President Smatrix and President Ashley, all, and UNLV all the way down, have been quick to see the drift of. Uh, our work and we're grateful for that. Uh, we deeply appreciate uh, uh, the support of the Lindsay Foundation uh, in all of this and other things going on in the region. And the same thing goes for leaders like Pat Mulroy of the Southern Nevada Water Authority, Jake Snow, the Regional Transportation Commission, Marsha Turner of the System of Higher Ed, Mike Yakira of Nev Nevada Energy, and Mike Saltman. And finally, uh, I want to thank, as I always do, Brian Greenspun for his wise and friendly counsel uh, and for his belief uh, uh, that Brookings can help uh, Las, Las Vegas continue to progress towards true uh, sustainable prosperity. You're lucky to have leaders and stewards like these. Uh, but I want to thank everybody here for coming. Uh, we're here to inaugurate and celebrate a new and more formalized relationship between Brookings, UNLV, uh, Southern Nevada, and the Intermountain West, indeed, uh, the West broadly. And that's very but. challenging times in Las Vegas. More and more it feels uh, like we're staring at a bona fide inflection point uh, in history, uh, a, de a deciding time. Um, lasting changes in U.S. Uh, uh, industry structure, spending patterns, and economic behavior, some of which uh, uh, Bill and Tholis alluded to, all look very much to have set up the conditions for a kind of historic national reset of the economy in which the nature of the economy shifts with huge implications uh, for all places. Uh, crisis is upon us and there may well be no return to normal because what has preceded this crisis was itself not normal. Uh, and that means that what matters now, you know, it, it, so moreover, it's, it's very likely that the present emergency is going to beget in some places innovation and in other places erosion. And that means that what matters now uh, is how places like Las Vegas respond to crisis. It's not, the, it's not the fact of the crisis, it's the response to the crisis that matters. Can Las Vegas respond decisively? And in the words of the great economist Wayne Gretzky, uh, skate tour, the puck will be not where it is, or will it simply wait to be saved by the business cycle and a hope for uh, return of business as usual? Uh, we would submit that the latter course uh, is not a wise one. And so what Rob Lang and I thought we would do this morning is celebrate Brookings' partnership here by uh, you know, saying why uh, the, the Metro uh, program is here, uh, 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 reviewing some of the challenges and emerging opportunities that we see, and then lastly, uh, 
uh, offering a vision of the way forward. Uh, uh, I want to touch on the first two points and then Rob Lang is going to conclude, at which point we're going to welcome questions and discussions. And, you know, please be pointed, uh, questioning, enthusiastic or hostile, we welcome that. So, in all you should know uh, that we do see you as a region of Wayne Gretzky, so we're uh, wanting you to be nimble and be thinking of where, where the puck is going. Uh, but to begin then, so uh, why are we here? Why is Brookings so interested in Las Vegas and the Intermountain West? And I think Bill has given uh, a number of broader reasons. I want to speak for Rob and I uh, as urban scholars. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but ultimately they come down to the extraordinary fact in which Las Vegas represents a kind of extreme point of America's metropolitan experience. One aspect of this is growth dynamics, uh, you know, uh, the things that we highlighted in our original report. Uh, uh, metropolitan Las Vegas grew at 17 percent between 2000 and 2007. That's 2.5 percent a year. Uh, so you were the fastest growing, or one of the very fastest growing segments of the fastest growing region in America. But since then, then population has just slammed to a halt and is likely, strikingly, is negative now, uh, almost certainly negative. Jeremy Aguero of Applied Analysis here, I think you know, uh, estimates the region will see its population slip by about 18,000 people this year. So this is an extraordinary time. Uh, and growth will return. Uh, you'll double in size by 2040, as our colleague Chris Nelson, who is here uh, from Utah, projects. But there's now tumult, and there will be further ups and downs. So such dynamics may not be fun for you, uh, but they make you interesting. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and they make you interesting to, to scholars like us. So for, uh, for scholars interested in the nature of fast growth, the nature of the dyna dynamism of this region, including its down uh, uh, sweeps, uh, this is the place to be. But another reason we're here is the constant invention in the West uh, of new urban forms. Uh, and Las Vegas is one of the nation's most prolific laboratories for new development types, whether it's the deliberate super density of the Strip, the city center mega project, uh, which is in a way an instant uh, urban core uh, and walkable uh, mixed use uh, uh, precinct, or the Boombergs tracked by my uh, uh, colleague Rob. And then finally, uh, we're here, and I think this is the most salient uh, uh, reason, the thing we want to talk about most, that you're essentially ground zero of the world economic crisis. In this connection, the litany of stress is sobering, is tracked by Brookings' Metro Monitor Trend Watch, which uh, we were asked, uh, uh, Bill was asked about uh, further trend work. We're going to be uh, uh, one of the first activities of the Brookings Mountain West uh, initiative uh, on its metro side is going to be a, a regular, uh, regularized quarterly index of key indices uh, for performance across probably 12 to 15 uh, large and medium-sized metropolitan areas. Uh, that, that sort of work will tell us uh, uh, things like the things we know now about Las Vegas. No large metro areas suffered house price declines greater than Las Vegas' 24 percent plunge. No large metro has a higher concentration of foreclosures. Gross metropolitan product has declined 3% since its last peak in, in uh, early 2007, and employment, uh, now exceeds, unemployment now exceeds 13%. You know this, but in this sense, I want, the point I want to make is that Vegas exaggerates America's economic quandary and the broader quandary of the country. It faces and spades the fundamental questions facing the whole uh, country. There's a growing consensus, for example, that the nation needs to export more goods and professional services and trade less on consumerism. Larry Summers, uh, the director of the National Economic Council, the key policy uh, 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 core in the White House says bluntly, the rebuilt American economy must be more export oriented and less consumption oriented. And indeed, consumption is down nationally, as Bill noticed, and savings rate is rising. And many econo economists argue that it's gonna stay longer for a long time. And yet this is potentially problematic for Las Vegas because few U.S. metros are as dependent on consumption as Las Vegas. Now we have a particular view of that consumption. We don't think it's just consumption, but nevertheless, there's a problem here. You see that Las Vegas on the left generates more than half of its metro private sector GDP from consumption activities, real estate activity, construction, eating, drinking, hospitality. 
with only Orlando anywhere near it. Uh, and you could look on down to the other end, and you see second bar from the right is uh, San Jose, 21% only. They, they have arguably a huge consumption sector, but the pie is so huge from exporting those iPods, uh, those uh, uh, computer hard drives, those new companies uh, developing electric cars. So uh, the point here is, is that you are in a vulnerable position. This super high reliance on consumption makes the region vulnerable to any wholesale consumption pullback, uh, whether national or, or global. Indeed, you export very few hard goods because your main export item is at this point the consumption item, uh, fun, fun and gaming at the purest form, but then broader things that we're gonna talk about uh, that are related but actually quite different. All of this means Las Vegas faces to a heightened degree many of the questions facing the whole nation. Las Vegas, for that reason, is totally compelling to uh, Rob and I and Brookings Mountain West. Your situation stages many of the questions raised by the current rebalancing of the economy. Where will the next period of growth come from? What, what should we do now? How will we use bad times to reposition? What should we invest in and how should we get better at what we do? Uh, in this sense, it's a great place for us to engage in the challenges uh, the whole nation faces and see what one representative place can do to renew itself with hopefully good advice, smart state and federal policy support, and great local leadership. So, uh, in that sense, uh, we don't view uh, Las Vegas as an aberration. We view it as a heightened example of, of the national predicament in certain ways, and that adds to our interest uh, in, in studying you. But let, this brings me now to uh, uh, your more immediate challenges and uh, opportunities. Uh, to help place to assess uh, their competitive standing, we at Brookings have developed what we call a blueprint uh, for American prosperity. The blueprint is a deep going prosperity analysis, theory, and federal policy agenda for metros that has helped many places as well as uh, the Obama administration, I might add, get a handle on what really matters in strengthening America's uh, communities and regional economies. According to the blueprint, true prosperity uh, depends on achieving three types of growth all at once. Productive growth that boosts innovation and productivity and so generates quality jobs and rising income. Inclusive growth that fosters a strong middle class by addressing the training and education needs of an increasingly diverse population. And then sustainable growth that promotes sensible urban form, reduces resource consumption and carbon emissions, and protects the environment. We're trying to get at here this sense we all have, this intuition we've had for decades, that you can't pursue one sort of prosperity. That prosperity is a broader thing than simply, you know, incomes, that broader than uh, you know, specific uh, new firm spin-offs. It, it's a more holistic vision. Now to achieve these goals, we argue the four sorts of local assets along with improved regional governance matter inordinately. Infrastructure matters because high quality transportation, electricity transmission and telecom networks are critical to moving goods, power, ideas, electrons and workers quickly. Innovation matters because the ability to invent and exploit products uh, processes and business models is critical for boosting productivity and competing lo uh, globally. A human capital matters because the innovation and demands of a more competitive economy require a workforce with education skill levels that are continuously rising. Uh, sustainability matters because the new economic order and desire for environmental stewardship revalues density, reduced carbon emissions, distinctive neighborhoods and vibrant downtowns and sees each of those uh, elements as ways to achieve the other parts. And then regional governance matters because decisive, nimble, wide-reaching governance networks are necessary to master today's complicated, supersized problems. And regional governance, after all, is how places put, put it all together. If you, can't, if you don't have an effective governance uh, 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 approach, you, you will not be able to have the nimbleness. You'll not be Wayne Gretzky uh, skating to where the puck uh, is going. So uh, against this framework then, let's, let's uh, probe a bit. How is Las Vegas doing now? With what deficits and yes, assets does Southern Nevada face the current uh, reset? Well, uh, the sobering indicators I ticked off 
uh, you know, are clearly uh, no secret. But what I want to do now is probe uh, understanding on some of these deeper fundamental drivers of prosperity that I've just mentioned, your infrastructure links especially, your innovation capacity, your sustainability and quality of place. And here there are definitely serious challenges to be surmounted, but uh, we would submit, uh, you know, some real opportunities ahead. Now start with the infrastructure, especially transportation infrastructure, which is just one type of infrastructure, but can stand as an example. On this front, the glaring fact remains that Las Vegas uh, is, like many of the other Mountain West metros, woefully underserved by transportation links. It's really quite astonishing how weakly uh, uh, this metropolis is connected. This owes in part to the fact that you came late to the great uh, freeway, uh, friends, freeway building frenzy of the last century. Uh, but at any rate, the state of affairs is extraordinary. On the highway front, Las Vegas and Phoenix are still the largest two adjacent metropolitan areas not served by an interstate highway. Uh, uh, and likewise, in some places, I-15, the crucial link between Las Vegas and LA, provides just two lanes in each direction. This simply does not befit a truly connected world-class metropolis. Uh, as to inner city rail links, you're also operating at a disadvantage. You don't have any. That's a disadvantage. <laughs> Uh, th this means that uh, the region lacks uh, transportation choice and another key accoutrement of the highly linked 21st century world city. If you, if you, have, uh, if you don't have an interstate going one way and there's uh, only four lanes going to Los Angeles and you don't have rail, you're not a world city, I would say. Uh, yet as it happens, Southern Nevada has actually gained momentum on this front. On the highway side, Brookings is Mountain West report and other uh, uh, discussions have helped reanimate uh, the whole uh, dialogue around the construction of an Interstate 11 uh, link, linking Las Vegas and Phoenix. And as to the rail problem, uh, Southern Nevada uh, to Vegas link has now been added to the Federal uh, and, uh, uh, Railroad Administration's High Speed Rail Corridor Designations Map, an important step forward. This is the official map. This is an important map, even though it's kind of an ugly one in some ways. Uh, these are the, you know, the formally recognized corridors at this point, the ones uh, that uh, uh, are in play in many respects. And uh, you know, your region is also beginning to create uh, a high-speed rail uh, alliance, or as a leader in a high-speed rail alliance that is seeking to uh, uh, fill this vast empty space that is the Intermountain West on this map and, and propose some other linkages into the interior. Uh, so that, that's, uh, this is true progress to, to have, in uh, less than a couple of years, to insert yourself into discussions at just the right time with, you know, uh, something like $12 billion in uh, high-speed rail money coming down the pike in the next couple of years. And then finally, uh, McCarran Airport remains a killer asset in the drive to create a true world city in southern Nevada. And this is the one thing that, that gives you some claim here. A forthcoming Brookings uh, data will show uh, just in a couple months, McCarran isn't just the sixth busiest airport in the nation. It's also one end of the single most heavily traveled short haul air corridor in America, the LA Vegas pathway. It's a huge amount of traffic and it's also, as our numbers are gonna show, uh, uh, a great argument for the high speed rail link. Uh, there's no way that uh, that kind of traffic, when growth returns, can itself be served by inefficient, you know, carbon belching short uh, air uh, uh, links. And I think that there will be a very uh, significant fact-based argument uh, for bolstering uh, this connection. And then especially important, uh, important uh, McCarran has multiplied its inter international arrivals by some 2,600 percent since 1990 a surge surpassed only by Phoenix, and really very few places have so quickly put themselves uh, in, in the international orbit. In short then, Southern Nevada, notwithstanding some truly glaring uh, infrastructure deficits, is moving successfully to fill, uh, uh, fill in the full complement of links it needs to move goods, ideas, and workers quickly. And I think what's uh, heartening here is there's been a general, a, a, a degree of cohesion uh, in, in the region's uh, uh, assertiveness here. It's time to push that work far further. But now let's turn uh, to innovation capacity, uh, the ability to invent and exploit new products, processes, business models. 
um, the, the ability to innovate matters because it heavily influences your ability to raise your labor productivity, develop new exportable goods and services, and stockpile high-wage jobs that can support a, a good standard of living. And on this front, uh, Las Vegas faces steep challenges. Uh, for example, scientific and technical R&D is a critical driver of innovation and economic productivity, but Las Vegas conducts very little of it in a region that doesn't do very enough of it. Uh, uh, you can see a uh, national average, uh, about 0.43% of employment in R&D. Uh, all of the Intermountain West metropo uh, metropolitan areas significantly behind that. And Las Vegas has you know, really a, a very modest activity uh, in technical or scientific R&D. Uh, as a result, uh, patenting rates, a key measure of the region's innovation capacity, remain you know, really very low. Uh, the, that top bar is, again, San Jose, producer of iPhones, uh, 475 uh, patents per 100,000 people a year. You know, Albuquerque, Colorado Springs, uh, Salt Lake City are all well ahead of uh, Las Vegas. Las Vegas, uh, uh, and this is, you know, an imperfect indice, but it nevertheless uh, uh, points to, you know, a gap in, in a key, what we view as a key uh, uh, asset uh, and weight and driver of growth. Uh, and then, so partly as a result, you remain uh, uh, relatively weak in critical green export activities that might become important to new, less, con uh, less consumption-driven Nevada economy. You can see here that uh, Vegas is exporting very little currently in terms of green products, just that little red bar in the middle. Uh, and as a result, uh, it sees a very low percentage of its employment in so-called green jobs, which is that dip in the green curve. So that bodes poorly. You really aren't a significant player at this point in, in, in uh, green export activities. And yet, uh, notwithstanding these challenges, the fact remains that Vegas has some true strengths in the race to move into higher value export-oriented uh, um, Pursuits. To begin with, uh, Las Vegas' labor productivity continues to outstrip most of its regional uh, competitors. Uh, 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 this is, uh, in many respects, a productive economy, a hard-working economy, uh, and uh, really just about the national average for that, but in a region where many metropolitan areas uh, don't have, uh, 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 don't look that great on their productivity indices. Likewise, and partly explaining the region's solid labor output, the region possesses as at least one true world-class source of export income and innovation. The gaming, entertainment, hospitality, hospitality convening, and I'm going to add professional services sector. To the extent that this sector can be moved more and more away from pure consumption and more toward high-end convening, meeting, deal-making, strategizing, uh, uh, and, and uh, related professional services, the more it will emerge as a true driver of high value business growth. And we think there are adjacencies to what you're doing uh, that offer uh, a truly uh, uh, more substantial uh, uh, presence here. And then your sunny natural assets, regional focus, concentration on this, and your convening power are building real momentum in the renewable energy sector. The region has been aggressive about deploying uh, solar, and I'm going to show a slide in a minute that shows that. The university is building relevant specializations, as we heard from Ron, including training programs, and getting into the game on new research concepts, such as the Department of Energy's forthcoming Energy Innovation Hubs program that Brookings has been involved in. We've worked very closely with Ron on this. And through mega convenings, like Senator Reid's Clean Energy Summit, uh, you're inserting yourself directly into national discussions at the highest level about the nature and direction of the clean energy uh, opportunity. In this respect, clean tech uh, becomes an excellent example of how moving up the value chain in professional convening sector can drive more substantive uh, economic development. You're, in a way, making it so simply by becoming the key place to talk about the direction and nature of this uh, sector. In some, you're moving in the right direction, though, this, though the sector as yet is still insignificant in terms of firm creation and export employment. But again, the drift is right. Which brings us to the last of the drivers I want to talk about today. You're standing on the creation of, sustainable, of a sustainable, high-quality place in the desert. Uh, to be sure, Southern Nevada faces significant challenges 
uh, in this uh, uh, connection. Climate change has heightened water supply questions to the point that the Bureau of Reclamation labels your region red on this map of water conflict potential. For the record, you're labeled conflict potential colon highly likely. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think you're already having some of these uh, uh, conflicts, uh, and I think at an earlier forum we had uh, the governor uh, of Utah actually uh, threatened jokingly to call out the National Guard on some of these uh, issues. But uh, the point is, you know, I mean, we, there's no way to uh, evade uh, uh, this, the, the importance of this issue. It may be overstated at times, sometimes in what I would call the hysterical New York Times Magazine, but uh, water supply questions remain a real and persistent challenge. Um, Likewise, while natural growth constraints have forced relatively dense development in, in the metro, past policy choices have left the region auto-dependent and poorly linked. Uh, you have, to an extent, a sometimes monotonous uh, and inefficient uh, urban fabric. And yet, all is not lost here. To begin with, a strong, dense urban co job core represents an important uh, starting point for shaping an efficient, dynamic, uh, metropolis. In this connection, uh, a recent Brookings report reported that 90 percent of Las Vegas area jobs located within 10 miles of the city center, a share that far exceeds uh, the metropolitan average in America and the share in, in any other Intermountain West metro. Uh, the centerness is something to, believe, uh, to build on, as the urban scholars here will tell you. It allows for effi efficiency, it focuses face-to-face -face dealings, it allows for trans transit solutions, and walkability if the region uh, chooses to embrace those. Beyond that, the innovative new uh, experiments in urban design uh, that you're pursuing, green architecture and walkable urbanism are beginning to retrofit uh, the, the autoscape. City center is hugely uh, uh, symbolic here. It's the biggest example of how Vegas has been trying to build a real mixed-use urban uh, uh, center at the heart of the Strip. A massive green project, uh, the center also points to a future Las Vegas that creates festive urban nodes, maybe out across the valley, inviting zones of walkability and ultimately a network of centers for transit-oriented development, such as may grow up around uh, the cool stops for your forthcoming uh, bus rapid transit system. Uh, and then, uh, while the term sustainable Las Vegas may still seem an oxymoron, huge strides have really been made uh, to begin to make it so. Per capita water consumption is plunging, uh, uh, nearly a 30% uh, nearly a 30 percent, uh, uh, cut in, the, in per capita gallons of water use per day. No region has shifted faster and further toward renewable energy than Nevada. Uh, look, at, I mean, look at the uptake uh, since around 1990 in which you not only catch precocious California, blow by it, and then now uh, are uh, in terms of overall total energy consumption from new renewables, the second most uh, 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 highly, uh, uh, highly connected uh, region in the country. You know, way, way, just completely beyond the U.S. average here. So this uptake uh, is, is important, and many economists view that local uptake does have, uh, 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 does lead to the uh, creation of expertise and, and broader uh, export opportunities. So uh, very heartening uh, performance there. And, this, uh, and then finally, uh, uh, you know, as a, partly as a result, Las Vegas' carbon footprint remains you know, below the national and regional average. Uh, this is a cardinal indicator of regional sustainability, and you're doing all right on it. Uh, in short, the tempo of change in Las Vegas, the rapidity of change in the past, and hopefully uh, going through the uh, present is, is going to allow a quite rapid retrofit of an unsustainable urban system that needs to keep going. You, you, have what a tremendous, you have a tremendous opportunity in dynamism, which allows change, allows retrofit much more uh, uh, easily than it does in some of the more built out regions. So in some, uh, Las Vegas face, faces the current uh, reset with some real strengths but it needs to use uh, the bad times well. So it's not the time to simply wait for the business cycle to return things to a more sluggish version of business as usual. Uh, it's the time to make new moves. It's the time to be bold. It's the time to build the infrastructure of a super connected, super innovative, and yet sustainable world crossing point. Uh, that's the challenge going forward. Uh, so uh, those are my remarks. What I want to do now uh, is uh, 
hand this to uh, my partner, uh, Rob. And, and in this sense, I've offered a kind of practical roadmap, uh, gr but great regions have great visions, they have great theories, they have deep intuitions about what they want to become and how they will make it happen. And so uh, to provide those uh, reflections pointing in this direction, I want to hand this to Rob Lang, who's going to propose, I think, a true operating uh, vision for how Las Vegas can leverage the new drivers of prosperity and claim you know, that full global city status. So after that, we are fully available for all sorts of questions. So, great. Great. Have fun. Running? Whoa, a little bit of feedback there. Okay, we're back. The other thing is, as I go through this, I'm going to refer to it as we, because I'm moving here. So I'm in. <laughs> Count me in. And, uh, you know, right away, my brother sends me, you know, he hears I'm moving to Las Vegas, he sends me, of course, the Time magazine. Yeah. He doesn't get the internet yet, he doesn't realize I could have read it. But I brought it along <laughs> as a prop. I mean, this is like a rite of passage. You have to have time beat up on you to be taken seriously. Florida got it, you know, it kept going after that. And, uh, you know, speaking of Florida, there's a, an urban scholar, Richard Florida, a, a fickle, a fickle fellow. He, sometimes hot and cold on cities. Sometimes he could think Phoenix is the bold new vision of the future. And the next week he could lump it in with Las Vegas and call it a city in the sand. Like, I guess there's cities in the prairie and they're okay. But if you're in the sand, then it's bad, you know, because again, he has that sort of probably superficial understanding, you know, people who arrive at the airport and like, where's the water? I don't get it. Well, there's mountains and it snows and it comes down, you know, probably doesn't quite get that. Uh, and, you know, on the plane, actually, uh, Mark and I discussed how to do this and I volunteered to take a stab. I, I don't presume to have a vision of the city's future. Uh, but what we want to do in the center, what we want to do in this initiative is kind of work with the community to lay out what that vision could be. And I started to write, and I said, I'm gonna write just like a page of notes. But, and I didn't pull out my laptop, you know, it was sort of tucked away. So, 15 pages of handwritten notes, which I will not cover. In fact, Marx immediately said, we gotta, we gotta take this and publish this. Because that's the kind of enthusiasm I have for this. In other words, I couldn't stop writing. There's just so much here. There's so much potential. There's so much fun. See, it's a fun place. You know, none of my relatives also, when I said I'm going to Las Vegas, you know, they get it. You know, when you, when you mention you're from Las Vegas around the world, people smile. They think of Elvis, <laughs> you know? It's not Tulsa. <laughs> Sorry if you're from Tulsa. Uh, and so, you know, in that sense, I'm extremely happy to be here. And I want to start by talking about, you know, how Las Vegas grew and how it can grow. And then I'll move on to connectivity and world city status, and then finally touch on some of what Mark said about the built form and the landscape. Well, the old driver of growth. Obviously, you know, people talk about boom and bust. It's got to have been more boom because you're a world city. So there's bust, but there's mostly boom. So start with that. Uh, and it, you know, it boomed on tourism. It makes sense that it's such a high percentage of GDP. That's not a problem. The, prob the problem is, that that's, that's vulnerable in a sense, but it's not a problem that you got to city size through that means. Going forward, you wanna contract that share. You wanna bring that share down, not in absolute terms, but in relative terms to the layers on top of the economy, and I think we can do that. Now, as far as peopling this region, it has been living by the kindness of strangers, with the biggest strangers being Californians. And they don't have a lot of love to give right now. I mean, it, there's still something to this growth model because right now, California is a mess of galactic proportions. And interestingly, its real estate has declined, but not at the same percentage that the house values have declined in Las Vegas. And any time a big differential opens up between the two regions, there's always that Orange County resident that gets a hold of a newspaper and says, look, honey, we could move out of our 1950s ranch burger shack in Costa Mesa and buy a McMansion in Las Vegas. Now, that has been both good and bad. 
Good in that people have come and bought those. Bad in that we wanted to provide too many of them for people who've yet to sell their houses. Now, someday, some of these Californians, they're gonna to get to selling their house again. That's the good news. And some of them are gonna come. But the important point is that there is some old growth potential left, but we must leverage that to bring about the new Las Vegas. That we still have some of that. It's not all gone. People who say, well, you can return to a model of growth of the past. It's true in part. I don't think it would ever produce the kind of robust numbers that we've seen, but it would produce you know, pretty substantial numbers. You know, it would be better than Cleveland's growth. It would be better than most of the country's growth. Uh, but that's not the point. Growth is not you know, an end in itself. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a point to leverage. And there's lots of opportunity to do that, that leveraging. And it's also you know, smart to, again, take that last opportunity, because I think this might be their last round at which the Californians provide that burst of people and resource and equity in their houses to build this economy. Uh, and in that old pattern, you know, the seeds of the new pattern arose, which is the city, of course, begins with tourism, it begins with gaming, and its next move is towards conventions. And the convention trade has been one of the great unreported stories about Las Vegas, because Las Vegas has moved to the leadership position in the country in that capacity. It makes sense, you know, a, a city nearby Las Vegas in this capacity, of course, Orlando. Orlando and Las Vegas have, in economic terms, what you know, an economist would reduce to a boring term like complementarities. What they have is just enormous hotels. And the hotels had capacity to have convention goers stay there and to enjoy you know, the stay in terms of especially here. Uh, it, if you're a kid, by the way, Orlando's your Las Vegas. You know. But for the adults, uh, you know, this town uh, is you know, a place that a lot of convention goers want to come to, want to, you know, want to enjoy. In fact, there's got to be some pretty large percentage of the American adult population that's got a Vegas story. You know? And it's in the popular culture this way, too. It's that you know, no one does Viva Pittsburgh. You know, or honeymoon in Seattle, or something like that. They do sleepless in Seattle, I guess. You know, but it's not, it's not quite as evocative of you know, a city as Las Vegas has that hook on popular culture. That's good. That's something important. And I think the importance you know, is, is at a moment, the, the fun that it has as a, as a city is a concern in just that, you know, in this latest round of sort of the new austerity, let's call it, somebody decided that you know, it's, it's not okay to have fun and do business. You know, and I won't mention who that person was, but it was a pretty high profile person. Man, you kill the fun out of Las Vegas, you kill Las Vegas. And there's nothing wrong with having an adult come to a city where they both conduct business and take in a show and enjoy themselves and have an experience. And you know, that's, uh, that's something that needs to be affirmed. There's no stigma to this. There's no reason to have a stigma to this. The idea that, you know, oh, well, we can't take water and send it to Las Vegas because it's all used by a bunch of degenerates. Nonsense. It's used for business development. And Mark alluded to that, and I want to go into a little detail on that. Who comes to this city? Everyone. It has a worldwide signature. It has a world space. The Strip is a world space. There's not many parts of the world where you can say that's a world space, where there is just an instant iconic recognition of it. But we have that. What an asset that is. There's no run from that asset. There's pride in that asset. It is what Washington is with government. And you think about what Washington did with government. Yeah, for years it was a sleepy town, burned, nearly abandoned. And then there was an enormous expansion of the federal government. That helped build Washington, but that was not the end of the story. Washington had a capacity like, for example, because it was the center of American defense industry, it had defense contracting around it. But it didn't just do defense contracting. At its core, it did, of course, government, direct expenditures for employees that worked in government. By extension, it took on contractors who worked in you know, defense sectors, the Beltway Bandit, so-called. But in addition to that, an industry like the internet emerged around Washington. Washington was capable of continuous leveraging and it leveraged its way into the most affluent large metropolitan area in the United States with the highest edu education attainment because it wasn't just a government town. It wasn't Ottawa. You know, it wasn't some of these places that really have just remained 
planned capitals. It became a region in full. And what Las Vegas has is an excellent ability to leverage what it has at its core by keeping that core, expanding that core, and then adding layer upon layer of additional economic development atop it. And a route to that starts with the conventions. The conventions, first off, are unreported and uncaptured in what impact they have on American business. Now, I actually first noticed what the conventions were about when I was invited to speak in 2006 at the International Shopping Centers, you know, the ICSC conference, which, by the way, has to be held in Las Vegas every year because it's too big to go anywhere else. When you get really big, you got to go where the show is. You know, when Elvis got too big, he had to go where the show was. The show's here. I went to this conference and, you know, they paid me for some keynote thing, I spoke, and I realized the point of this conference had nothing to do with what I was talking about. I went into the deal-making floor, and I saw people connecting, people who had retail that they wanted to locate somewhere, people who had land available, cities that wanted the retail revenue, all in this giant area that had been constructed, by the way, as a mini temporary mall with skilled labor that can put on a show, and I'll get back to putting on shows in a minute. And I noticed this is what this conference is about. And I went out with some of these folks who had met for the first time. And they started to build trust with each other, which is the basis of a deal. Now, we have all this telecommunications equipment. It's wonderful. You can follow up with anyone. But in the end, you have to look somebody in the eye and trust them. That happens here. This is probably the leading place as a market exchange where people come together, look each other in the eye, and begin to establish a relationship. Even better, they end up going out that night. And they do things that night, maybe, that they need to trust each other on. <laughs> That's a good thing. Now, I've been walking around saying, yeah, I love this ad campaign. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's great. The flip side of it is what happens in Vegas is transforming the world economy. There are whole industries that, if they didn't have an annual meeting here, would fall behind. Imagine telecommunications. You know, imagine, you know, all the cell phones you have in your pockets. A cell phone that's two years old is a dead cell phone. A year-old iPhone is a, is a dead cell phone. And all the patenting, all the venture capital that has to come together. And so for that moment, you know, Las Vegas is the leading center of fill in the blank that week. Uh, and what's interesting, too, is as you advance telecommunications, the amount of time you spend face-to-face -face is actually shortened but intensified. We can do so much apart from one another that the moments that we come together take on an extra critical capacity and dimension, just a moment of intense exchange. Las Vegas' specialty is that moment. Now again, so far what's been happening is it's been lost to the air that what happens in Las Vegas is not counted like the Chicago Board of Trade. What happens in Las Vegas is not counted like the New York Stock Exchange. It's so uncounted that Richard Florida says, you're not creative. <laughs> he's not seen these shows. These shows are creative. You're not creative because he's using dorky, old-style statistics. The whole economy's up in an aircraft right now. It's not in any one place. But when it lands, and it does land here, and people see each other and meet each other and start business networks and connect worlds, that's where things take off. Now, what can Las Vegas do with that? Well, there are some things that you're just happy to provide the tourist capacity for. You're just happy to make the hotel and the, you know, the sale of food and the show off of that exchange. There are other things, however, bigger things that can be captured. What Las Vegas needs to do is systematically look and ask itself this question, what is of temporary nature here that could be made more enduring? What is now ephemeral that could be made permanent? And I think one of the first moves in this direction is what's happened with the big world city market, you know, the big furniture show. You know, furniture doesn't come from Las Vegas. Nothing comes from Las Vegas. In the future, everything could come from Las Vegas, but really nothing comes from Las Vegas. Furniture came really as a major industry out of the Carolinas. That's where the lumber is. You know, you cut the wood and you don't want to transport it that far because it's heavy, so you make the furniture next to it. So High Point, North Carolina was a major center of trade shows, and it still is. But when the trade show got really big, it had to go to Las Vegas. 
And what Las Vegas did is it captured that in the form of a gigantic year-round, although there's these sort of biannual events off of it, but a year-round permanent trade show. A wonderful thing. Now, what does that mean? First off, it obviously brought into you know, the city something that it lost every year as it sort of filtered away. But more importantly, what it could do is it could change some of, and this is a key leveraging, it could, it could change some of the rest of the Las Vegas economy. For example, with furniture comes design. And design is not an inconsequential thing to have, ask Milan. Design is great. Design is everything. Design could be industrial design. So Las Vegas now, which had really you know, no history of furniture manufacturing, uh, it didn't even make stuff like Santa Fe made. Santa Fe made furniture. People took it and sent it around the world. You know, beaten up. Turns out, by the way, they left that stuff on their porch. It got beaten up, and then Easterners saw it and decided they liked it. So now they just start by beating it up. Las Vegas didn't have that. But what Las Vegas had was it did meetings. It did convenings. It did it on a grand scale. And now what it has, it is, has the big trade show in this. And what it could get is designers, architects, urban design specialists. And this is not you know, an unexpected capacity to add. This is something that you would expect off of, in fact, just the sheer scale of a trade show like that. Now, another thing that Las Vegas has been doing is in terms of just the energy numbers. This is a logical place for alternative energy in multiple ways. First off, it's just near California, which is a user, and the closer you are in generation of non-renewable to, to the source, I mean, to the, to the consumption of it, the better off you are. If the source is close to consumption, Nevada is near giant population centers in central Arizona and southern California and the Bay Area, and so it's advantaged in that. But what it could become is an entire sort of resource, resource space, just a backwater, if you will, the place where they harvest it, where they you know, yank it out of the sun or take the wind off a mountain. What it wants to be is a place that not only has that capacity, but is like Houston. Houston had oil. Houston has less oil now, but Houston is so critical in the world economy of energy that Houston's oil is almost inconsequential. There are certain kinds of finance that you can only do through Houston, certain kinds of technology and exploration that Houston captured and added. It started as a natural resource economy and added a layer that makes Houston one of the cities where the percentage of growth, you know, there's these eastern cities now in the eastern part of the Sun Belt where their percentage of those growth numbers, you know, where construction and all these other tourist numbers drop down to minuscule because they've added banking on top of it. You know, and, or they've added energy in the case of Houston. Well, what Las Vegas wants to do is be the Houston of alternative energy. Now, can you convene your way to that capacity? Or is there something about you know, Houston, let's say, that just made it a kind of natural uh, center of energy knowledge, not just production? I don't think that's true. I think this is up for grabs, quite frankly. And I think convenings are important, and I'll bring to your attention a convening that was especially important in the biotech field. Biotech was something that no one knew what it was in the 1970s. They had just barely figured out the structure of DNA in the 1950s. Most of the knowledge of what would become biotech was housed in the East. It was especially in places like Cold Spring Harbor, a national bio lab in Long Island. It was in you know, central New Jersey, around Princeton. It was around Philadelphia, in all these pharmaceutical firms. The upstart city of San Francisco, which is always so entrepreneurial and clever. Always, people always talk about San Francisco values. Throw in the San Francisco values, just sheer entrepreneurship. San Francisco creates an event called the Asilomar Conference, which is at this beautiful state beach at Monterey. It's, it's nice when you've got a nice facility like that. And they put a, put a conference together. And the San Francisco researchers brought out investment people, a lot of New York expertise, and they had this giant convening. It's, it's really, it's not well known outside the circles of biotech, but it's called the Woodstock of biotech. It was the first gathering. The herd came. The herd discussed. And what they laid down was the whole frame by which biotech would proceed. Genentech came out of it. Big companies came out of this meeting, actually. Faculty in the universities that didn't realize that they could be wealthy were alerted to the fact that they could be wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just work with glassware and grad students. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, you, are, you could transform the world. They made these kind of connections. And folks in the Bay Area who understand that, you know, the economy is not some abstract thing. The economy is real and on the ground, that they grab the share of that biotech economy. They had good capacity in universities. They had folks that were loaded with venture capital and willing to take risks. They had the right elements. But they also had the show. They put on a great show. And the question about Las Vegas is, what does the show mean here? The show means a lot because becoming publicly identified like this university and city have been with alternative energy is actually important. You're on the map. And this is what Las Vegas does well. It does shows well. So Las Vegas doesn't just have to go through and figure out what its convention capacity is and decide, well, let's take that from temporary and make that permanent. Las Vegas could just look at anything, any field where the show matters. It can reach out and it can grab it. It can do it if it chooses. And you don't do it for everything. You're strategic and you don't need that many of these things to click to become a much larger region and a much larger economy and to shrink down that share that now seems explosive. But again, that's why you're here. You know, a number like that is in one context, wow, this is worrisome. Wow, this is why you're here. No one saw Las Vegas coming. Chris Nelson and I are working on a book on megapolitans. We went and we looked at the sort of historic projections from the 1970s forward. They only missed one big region. All of the research has missed Las Vegas. No one had it at over one million in the metropolitan area in 2000. They had Albuquerque. Albuquerque. <laughs> they didn't have Las Vegas. You know, and that's part of the story. No one sees it coming. No one sees what it is because it doesn't look like it's doing anything. Yet, in a knowledge economy, it's doing it everything, potentially. It's doing what it wants. It's in control of its fate. That's the key thing here, because this capacity is non-replicable. No one is going to build the gigantic hotel industry. <laughs> the competitor is Orlando. And believe me, you know, what happens in Orlando apparently is the source of a lot of domestic problems later on, <laughs> because the kids have gotten into something at Disney, someone kicked Mickey or something like that. Orlando is not going to become Las Vegas. If Orlando became Las Vegas, there would be a lot of you know, questions and concerns by you know, Universal Studios and the big investors there who are always keeping it clean. You know? And this place tried to be Orlando for a while and found out the folly of that. And it's back to its Rat Pack self and good because <laughs> adults get it. And that's what you need. So yes, the answer is I believe we can convene our way to an energy economy like that. And, we're, and we also have the capacity in the university. We have the other elements in place. Now, the city is a world city, which means it's connected. One of the interesting things recently, working on a world city project, part of which is published by Brookings, uh, a colleague of mine in Belgium got a hold of all the airline data from the Belgium airline, which went out of business because high-speed rail killed it, because all the trains came from Paris now, so fast that you could just go to Brussels by train. And the uh, million dollar database was handed to a bunch of researchers at universities because the company didn't have any stake in it anymore. And we were able to determine where you got on a plane and where you got off. Not that, you know, the way you go through Atlanta or Dallas. If you're going to hell, apparently, there's a stopover in Atlanta. You know, it's a temporary <laughs> moment in purgatory. I can tell you which terminal, too, by the way. Because I have been there. And, uh, you know, we looked and it was this kind of where you get off the plane. You know, point to point. And it was interesting to look at the density of travel that Mark mentioned. Well, they found a lot of men traveling alone, apparently, to Las Vegas. <laughs> I said, Rio comes up high on this. Are you going to tell me everybody going to Rio is doing business? You know, and so the, the point was made. And the key thing is that this region already has the airport capacity. What it does not have is surface transportation connections. And that's key because the two nearby big regions and Las Vegas in the future are probably going to function as a super region. The whole southwestern U.S. will be linked up with Southern California, Phoenix, and Las Vegas so proximate with such density of exchange and communication that that will be the zone by which Las Vegas integrates into a world economy, into the whole global economy. So these service transportation links are essential. And, you know, starting with Interstate 11, 
can we please get this interstate? Now, if there were it's a fair world out there, and apparently the world's not fair, Interstate 11 would be under construction as we speak, and that the federal government would have you know, worker bees out there banging away, turning big rocks into little rocks. Because when the interstate system was coming down the pike, when people were offering the money for this, they gave it to places much smaller than Las Vegas and Phoenix to be linked up. For instance, Amarillo and Lubbock are linked up. Who paid for it? Federal government. Why? They both just met the minimum of the 1950 census, which was the basis for planning the interstates. We have an interstate system that assumes an urban geography in the United States that is 50 and 60 years out of date now. These cities happened. Vegas happened. Phoenix happened. They're enormous. They're the two largest interior southwestern cities, two biggest regions, and they have a Roosevelt error WPA provided road. <laughs> now finally, we have the bypass and the bridge. But my God, this isn't a bridge to nowhere. That's the bridge to somewhere. That's the bridge between the two biggest cities in the United States not linked. If you ever even got to the 70 census and recalibrated, it would have been provided. So this is not begging the federal government. This is, hey, imagine a logical country that updates its data and looks honestly at where things stand and provides infrastructure in accordance with those demands, that would be what? That would be good. And that's what we need. So this is not, you know, again, begging for it. The other thing is, of course, the high-speed rail. And yes, we deserve it on the very same grounds, which is, first off, just looking at energy. When that plane takes off, that he should, Mark showed the shot of the shorter haul aircraft, the burst of energy to lift off is the equivalent of the, tr of the train with the same number of passengers. You don't want to bring down those numbers, as Bill noted. You, you got to start with high-speed rail. The rest of the world, Asia and Europe, are doing this. Our competitors are doing this. They see this as a tremendous efficiency. Now, there are folks out there, most recently in the Washington Post, an economist, Samuelson, wrote, the U.S. can't do this. It's not dense enough. He used the entire American continent's density that includes Montana. I don't even know if he threw Alaska in, but I hope he did, because it's about as irrelevant. You know, in the 1870 census, they came up with a concept called the frontier. Everybody thinks they came up with the frontier concept because they wanted to celebrate the frontier. No, they didn't. They wanted Europeans who were then comparing data to have the parts of the U.S. that were already developed so that as point of comparison, they could look to the Northeast <coughs> and to California and begin to compare that to the denser parts of Europe. The U.S. through its megapolitan areas is as dense as Europe and we're adding millions and millions of more population to those places. Europe's done growing. It's amazing, Europe is almost building our infrastructure in places where they're not gonna grow. It's like, you know, they, they, somebody has not sent a memo to them that they have all this excess capacity that we could use. Uh, and so it makes, it makes sense on the most basic grounds. I mean, could Bobby Jindal have been off more that night? First off, you know, Bobby Jindal, if you'll recall, gave the response to the President's State of the Union or his kind of inaugural speech, if you will, to Congress. And in that response, he picked on uh, volcano monitoring, something he finds funny. Maybe in other parts of the country they find hurricane monitoring funny, but it's not funny. And he picked on high-speed rail. And he said, oh my God, I want to build it to Disneyland. Well, first off, there is rail to Euro Disney. And the most successful Amtrak train is called the auto train to Orlando. Yeah, it's good to have a lot of use at what end? Like Los Angeles, like Orange County, and a lot of use at the other end, Las Vegas Strip. You tell me it's not used? At three in the morning it's under use. <laughs> Point to point, makes sense. So, you know, this is sort of, boy, could you be off. And of course, the, the funny part of the story is, Mark showed the map, it runs through, you know, or New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Jindel's asking for the high-speed rail money. For, he's competing with us now, after getting up there and saying, this is some sort of boondoggle. He's boondoggling his way into a request. So, this is right. It's right on a lot of grounds. And it's right on one more ground that is not commonly discussed. We are behind on this, way behind. Good. Sometimes it's good to start with nothing. First off, we don't have to upgrade the halfway high-speed rail system. We have none. That's point one. <laughs> Two, somebody in the world knows how to do this already, and we're the largest market in the world where it's not getting done. They're gonna wanna get in here. And you know what we're gonna say when they come in here? Show us how to build them, because go ask Boeing. Boeing sells planes to China, and here's what China says. Sure, we'll buy a lot of them. 
show us how to build them. And what is Boeing going to say? No, because Airbus will say yes. Of course you, oh, you can have the airframe. You could have avionics. You could have some piece of this thing. We're going to be able to ask for and demand. You want to play in our big market with nothing? It's like a blank slate to you guys. You want to live out your sort of, you know, development fantasy of linking up the whole U.S.? We're your partners. And that means that some of this capacity is going to shift to the United States, and it's going to shift to the places where that high-speed rail is under construction. And it's totally up for grabs. It's another thing that Las Vegas could think of as an opportunity. Uh, and this one day could be a major industry. This could be the dominant way that people get around less than 300 miles. And three or 400 miles, which is the range of this, links you in the Southwest to all sorts of places and in the rest of the country to all sorts of places. It's going to get done. This administration, maybe. It's going to get done. It's just too inefficient to use short-haul aircraft. A third of the flights coming out of, you know, Las Vegas Airport right now are heading to Southern California. Same thing with, with Phoenix. So that sort of nexus will be built, and that's a key ingredient. And finally, what I want to cover, just wrap quickly, is Las Vegas' built form. I did a piece a few years back where I compared what I call the wet and dry sunbelts. The wet sunbelt, you're not in. <laughs> Although there are times you're wetter than the wet sunbelt because you plan for water, where in Atlanta, they stick a pipe in the Chattahoochee River and they pray for rain. If it stops raining for two weeks, they're out of water. You know, and then it, miraculously, it rains the next week and they're back in business. Uh, but the wet sun belt is interesting in that one of the things that you find in the east, and this is cities like Charlotte, and Nashville, and Atlanta, is that they have built a wide-ranging metropolitan form, spanning the globe, hundreds of miles out there, 50, 60, 70 miles. Half the people, for example, in the metropolitan area of Nashville live below what the census considers urban, even though they're all metropolitan residents. Only about 5% of Las Vegas lives in an area outside what is considered urban. Urban means you've got plumbing. The reason is, you know, there's federal lands around us. That constrains us. There's also just aridity and people have to have water to their house. The bad news is that this density has produced an unusual form of dense sprawl that's auto-dependent. The good news is that that is an urban design challenge that can be retrofit upon the existing landscape. Atlanta and Charlotte have to pull everybody back in. They literally have to reach out and sort of grab the elements back in. So there is an advantage, a, and that's why the numbers look good, by the way, in terms of you know, footprint and so on. There is an advantage to the West's built form. Uh, another thing is that you know, the Las Vegas, of course, is known for its whimsy and architecture, and that's good. Las Vegas should never lose that the funness, the, the kind of shock of Las Vegas. And it is making strides towards building a somewhat traditional built form in terms of bus rapid transit and the station stops and all the like. I'll just add, you know, add to this and sort of conclude with, at the moment it looks like you know, the new model is about to emerge. The model that said Las Vegas could have its own indigenous architecture in city center and didn't have to sort of mimic the Eiffel Tower or you know, New York City, let's say. Well, at that very moment, suddenly, boom, the economy goes south. The economy falls apart. But these things that are un underway and will be finished shortly, when they're built, remind me of where, let's say, New York was in the 1930s as it delivered the Empire State Building and Rockefeller Center into a recession. And the story's off that one. No one's ever going to occupy it. It's never going to work. Rockefeller Center was a city in a city. And there was all this doom and gloom, if you look at the news accounts at the time. But what it did is it showed New York the new way. It showed New York the future. Actually, after Rockefeller Center, the rest of the 60s and 70s build out of the east side, that whole midtown complex of office space, mimicked a Rockefeller Center, stylistically. And I think what's happened is Las Vegas had enough momentum under that old growth model to reach a point of significant maturation at which it had come into its own. The disaster of the moment is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to sit back and decide what we want to be when we grow up. And the seeds of that sort of development exist. You know, a region of a couple of million wanting to grow up sounds almost funny, but it's true. It's in its infancy. It's the newest big region in the United States. It is the newest built form of any large-scale metropolitan area in the United States. And the very things that look like they're terrible overhangs and, tr and problems at the moment are the resources and are the sort of shining examples of the future. And I think that's the moment we're in. And you know, if you have a positive view of the future and you don't assume that this is all a downward trajectory, then something like city center matures and is the Rockefeller center of this region. And this region's 
signature architecture is something that maybe somebody will do a Las Vegas. You know, the, the success comes when somebody in another part of the world knocks off a definitive defining Las Vegas building, and that's the full circle, and I hope I'm here when that happens. Thank you.